Hi, everybody. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Kyla Cools, and I'm the Heritage Program Coordinator for Patapsco Heritage Greenway. I just want to thank you again for joining us and welcome you all to our second virtual talk of our 2022 Patapsco Days celebration. Our theme this year is pioneering along the Patapsco in honor of the various forms of innovation, both past and present, to take place in the Patapsco Valley. Uh, joining us today, we have Kelly Palick from the Howard County Department of Recreation and Parks to talk about archaeology and its significance in the Patapsco Valley. So um, I'll invite Kelly to introduce herself real quickly and then uh, give us her presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, my name is Kelly Palick and I, I see from the attendees, I know a lot of you, so I'm glad to see everybody here. And for those of you I don't know, I'm glad to see you here as well. Um, I am the Heritage Program Coordinator for the Living History and Heritage Program with Howard County Rec and Parks, and I am also the archaeologist for Rec and Parks, and I am going to start sharing my screen because I'll talk a little bit more about my background, and all right, can everybody see my screen? Kyla, you can, you can say. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, we can see your screen. And um, for everybody who may have questions uh, throughout the process, please feel free to enter it in the chat and or uh, click the raise hand button uh, on your lower toolbar. All right. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so I am going to be talking about preserving the past, why archaeology matters in the Patapsco Valley Heritage Area. And so a little bit about myself before we start to help you understand why I wanted to give this talk tonight. I've been with the Living History and Heritage Program since 2017. I've been an archeologist and a museum educator for the past 21, 22 years now. So I've been in the field since undergrad. Uh, I received my bachelor's from Washington College in anthropology and I received my master's in public anthropology from American University. Archaeology has always been a passion of mine since I was a little girl. I remember the exact moment when I was bitten by the bug. I was about seven years old and my grandparents took me to Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, when we were out walking, the archaeologist there let me kind of scratch at the surface with a trowel and let me hold up an artifact in my hand. And I was hooked from that minute. I didn't realize at that point that I could actually make a career out of it though. Uh, as an undergraduate, I began to see the importance of the past to the public. I became specifically interested in public archaeology um, and archaeology education. For my senior thesis, I researched how archaeologists could incorporate archaeology within the fourth grade curriculum. Uh, and I focused in Harford County Public Schools, where I was from. This significance was reiterated as a graduate student as I learned about the African American burial ground in New York City. Uh, one symbol in particular that was found on many of the coffins was the Sankofa symbol, which is a symbol of the Akan tribe in Ghana. And its literal translation is, it is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. Other translations include, to know your future, you can't forget your past. So this symbolism really struck me at the time, and it really cemented my desire to pursue my career in public archeology span and help local communities remember and document their past. Archaeology has the power to teach modern day communities of the past, whether good or bad. Studying the material culture left behind from past generations not only speaks of the significant events in history, but also of the everyday lives of those whose voices have often been ignored or deemed insignificant. This above all else is why archaeology should matter within the PVHA and everyone for that matter. So before we start, um, what is archaeology? And I have the, you know, it's not dinosaurs, not Indiana Jones. In its simplest terms, archaeology is the study of the human past through the material culture humans leave behind. It differs from history in that it transcends the limit of the written record. Oftentimes, archaeology is the only way we can study specific cultures or groups of people. So archaeology is a science that helps us understand where we came from, how we lived, and how we interacted within our environments and affected our environments. So this, this um, 
this graphic here just kind of shows the whole process of going through an archaeological project. It's not just going out and digging. It's a, it's a scientific process. So why is archaeology relevant as a discipline? Uh, there's a number of benefits to archaeology, which I will discuss here. So archaeology for research. Archaeology, first and foremost, has intellectual value. We can use the knowledge we interpret from the material record to inform the future. So one example of this is understanding our environmental history to understand how the past can reveal possible solutions for climate change in the future. And a second way, uh, this is especially relevant in our heritage area, archaeology has also helped us understand how technologies and ideas have evolved over the last several thousands of years. One of the ways we understand the Patapsco River Valley as the cradle of the Industrial Revolution is through the study of um, industrial archaeology and you know, the archaeology of mill sites, of railroad stations, um, bridges, infrastructure. So the next benefit is um, a passion of mine, archaeology for education. These are all images um, from some of our programs that we do with children and um, adults as well. So archaeology is a multidisciplinary tool that can be used to teach people of all ages about math, science, reading comprehension, art, and critical thinking. Archaeology can also be used as an educational tool to teach communities about the respect and stewardship of the past. And um, so a, a passion of mine is working closely with Howard County Public Schools and getting archeology span into the classroom. You know, second grade gifted and talented used to have a CEU unit on archeology. span They don't really, they're kind of phasing that out, but I'm still trying to work with the social studies coordinator to get it in in some capacity in different grade levels. So archeology span is fun and exciting to at least most people I have interacted with. It is a topic which is something for everyone to learn, whether it be historical research, just getting your hands dirty in the dirt, making databases, or mending pottery vessels. The next benefit is archeology span for economy. And this is, I think, really important to a heritage area. Archeology span can help enhance local communities through a myriad of ways. Historic and archeological preservation can help revitalize struggling communities by bringing more jobs through preservation, enhancing property values, and helping bring in more revenue through heritage tourism. Archeological interpretation of historic sites and properties can also enhance community life. Knowing a community's history, its total history, can help enhance community life through knowing that history. And kind of a newish topic, um, is archaeology and social justice. This is, I guess, really kind of taken, taken root in the, over the past couple of years. So violence and injustice against African Americans, Native Americans, gender, LGBTQ, immigrants, and other minority communities have antecedents in the past. Archaeology helps us understand the production of equality, the representation of power, and targeted discrimination of communities through the material culture left behind. It gives voice to those who lacked privilege representation in the dominant historical record. So the two images I have here are actually two newish books that really hone in on the, the subject of social justice within archeology. span And they're very good books if you're interested. So thus far we have seen various ways how archeology span matters, but what about in the Patapsco Valley heritage area? As you can see, and I, I, I don't know if this is the exact boundaries, I kind of did it by, by comparing the, um, the actual map, but this is the Maryland Historical Trust cultural database. And you can see how many sites have been identified within the heritage area. It's not a lot. Um, there's a lot more, uh, a little just further south along the Route 1, um, I-95 BWI corridors. Um, and there's fewer, oh, sorry, fewer sites the further west. This is primarily due to the heavy construction in the industrial areas versus more farmland and protected land in the west. So much of the heritage area consists of portions of the Patapsco Valley State Park, 
which you can see in this highlighted area, it's the, the greenish area, where sites presently identified are protected and little to no archeology span has been done recently. They also don't have a park archeologist to conduct this research. Um, other land that um, is plentiful in this area is park and rec land and um, county land, which sites are protected on county land. And then also we have the two historic districts that designated historic districts in Howard County, Ellicott City and Lawyers Hill, which are both inside of the heritage area. And ideally these should be protected, um, but that's not always the case, but they're getting better with that. So even the sites that have been recorded, very few have been properly researched by, beyond um, a mere surface collection or site visit. A lot of the sites that are listed on the site, while it looks like there's a lot, a lot of it is just somebody visiting a site, finding a scatter of artifacts and recording it. So these have not all been intensely investigated. A quick comparison um, that I always like to show um, for why we need archaeology in Howard County and the heritage area for archaeological protection in Howard County versus surrounding counties. We only have, I think we're up to 307 sites identified now versus Anne Arundel, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, and Baltimore County. Why? Why is this, why is this so um, unbalanced? It's because Ordinances are, and protections are actually put in place in Anne Arundel and Prince George's County. And Howard County has nothing um, protecting it, except for if it's on state or federal land or county land. So this has been a huge dilemma for professionals in the field, not just in Howard County, but in other uh, unprotected jurisdictions. And there are, um, I have several colleagues who are, who are fighting presently to get these ordinances in place. Um, I know the city of Frederick is the most recent to have this ordinance put in place. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, looking at the spread of sites throughout the heritage area, you can visualize the pattern of settlement from the Native American seasonal camps to the colonial era tobacco farms, to the later area of industry and innovation, even up to the late 19th and early 20th century farmsteads and tenant farms of the western portion of the heritage area. As such, there have been quite a few significant sites that have been investigated throughout the heritage area that help address some of the issues mentioned above. All of these sites are presently located on protected land, whether protected through the National Register of Historic Properties, preservation easements, or located on county property. The interpretations of each of these sites hold a lot of significance to the history of the heritage area whether it be through Native American history, the study of race and ethnicity and gender. Without the investigation of these sites through archeology, span the history of the heritage area would not be as rich for interpretation. So these are three of the sites I'm going to talk about. The first site um, is the Elkridge site. And I, I couldn't quite tell if this site was exactly in the heritage area, but it's right on the border um, of, 95 and Patapsco Valley State Park. Even if it's not, it's it's very it's representative of the other of other sites that are in the heritage area. So it, it's warranted to be discussed. The Elkridge site has been interpreted as a late archaic woodland stratified seasonal camp that sits on a high terrace overlooking the Patapsco River. This site, and you can see on the map on the left hand, whoops, on the left hand side where it, it's located. So it's, it sits on the Patapsco River and then it's also along the Stony Run uh, tributary of the river. This site was originally slated to become an industrial park, but thanks to some tree clearing, the site was identified during a surface survey in 1967. Uh, that year, a gentleman named Wayne Clark, who was not yet a, a professional archeologist, but he later became a professional archeologist. And his father identified surface scatter um, once these trees were cleared. And that included projectile points, flakes, and pottery. During this investigation, they uncovered projectile points and other what we call debitage or waste um, associated with stone tool manufacture. They found hammer stones and ground stone tools, 
pottery, and even parts of a red clay tobacco pipe. I do not know where these artifacts are. I don't know if they just left them there um, in situ. They also uncovered what they believe to be six potential post molds, um, which are dark stains in the ground that are remnants of where a post was put in the ground. And these, um, these give clues to archeologists whether there was a structure there, a standing structure. And they also found what they thought were boiler stone dumps. So boiler stones are used in, cook in prehistoric cooking. Because of these finds, as well as the scattered artifacts, they believe this could have been a potential Native American village site along the Patapsco River. A year later in 1968, the Maryland Academy of Sciences did further investigations, although there's little to no records of their investigations. What records do exist report a number of test pits excavated where only remnants of projectile points and stone flakes were recovered. Uh, the results of this investigation interpreted this, they interpreted the site to be a possible quarrying or stone tool manufacturing site. So back in 1987, uh, the Maryland State Highways, they were doing a, a highway improvement project on I-95, which would they believe would destroy part of the site. So archeologists were called in to conduct further investigations of the site. This proved to be the most productive and thorough investigation as of 1987. So they placed one one by one meter excavated to one meter in depth. And you can see the image on the left-hand side from the, this is like the field school note field off report. This was crucial because previous investigations halted excavations at only 50 to 60 centimeters below surface. Um, so they didn't actually excavate as deep as they could have gone. And you can see where they excavated and then they took, it just got too deep and they augured down to see how much further down the unit went. No cultural features were identified, but um, fire cracked rock, which suggests a possible hearth area, although that is a feature, um, suggests a pop possible hearth area, along with projectile points and stone tool debitage and pottery, which I'll show you some images of shortly from all eras of the woodland period. The significance of this investigation was not that it found intact cultural features, but it was identified to be a very well protected and stratified site. One that could provide a very good understanding of the lives of Native Americans in the Patapsco Valley from 1800 BC to 1500 AD. Further work has been conducted over the last 20 years by Dr. Bob Wall of Towson University. Um, he did his master's thesis on this site. There's not been anything published on this site yet. Um, I know he's still out there working. So hopefully that report will be coming out once he finishes at that site. I think he might be going back out there this summer. So here's just some pictures of artifacts that were, um, these are the actual artifacts, but these are examples of what was found. So there were different um, pottery types from early woodland through late woodland, suggesting that long period of occupation. Same with, you can see the progression of projectile points from the broad spears to the triangular points of the bow and arrow. And these are some other examples of the artifacts that were recovered. The image on the top left-hand side are what we call the boiler stones. So these stones, these cobbles would be fired and then they would be placed in water to boil water. And then hammerstone and a, a fragment of a clay pipe that was locally made by Native Americans. So it's important to know that no permanent village site has been identified along the Patapsco River Valley. Um, this 1608 map of Captain John Smith does not show anything. Um, I don't, he might not have traveled up the Patapsco River, um, but that isn't to say that they were not here. That they just weren't documented at that time. And nothing has been recorded archeologically as of now. The Patapsco River Valley was believed to have been a shared hunting ground and resource procurement area for the Susquehannock and Piscataway nations and other um, localized groups. Based on these assumptions, this site has presently been identified as a seasonal camp. Groups traveling inland from the coastal plain 
and from further north for hunting and resource procurement. And then they would travel back to their, their home areas. The Elkridge site is important to the Patapsco Valley heritage area because of the story it can tell us about the Native American cultures that lived here prior to European settlement. So the next site I would like to talk about is a, a fascinating site. It's the Benjamin Banneker Homestead. And many of you have most likely been to this, uh, this site. The, Benjamin, the Benjamin Banneker Homestead was the home site of American's first African-American man of science, Benjamin Banneker. Born in 1731, he was a self-taught astronomer, mathematician, author, and surveyor of the nation's capital. While much is known of his achievements, little is known about the day-to-day -day life of Benjamin and his family, a free Black family living in the antebellum Maryland frontier. Because what is now Baltimore County was considered a frontier at that time. The history of this family could yield significant information on the history of free Blacks in the antebellum period, as very little archaeological research has been conducted on this topic, especially in the Piedmont. Um, it's, the focus has mostly been on sites of enslaved laborers or postbellum home sites. So this is why archaeology was beneficial. What is known about the homestead historically is that in 1730, Mary and Robert Banneke slash later Banneker purchased a 100 acre tract of land called Stout from Roger Gist or Gist, however you pronounce it. They purchased it for 7,000 pounds of tobacco and it took them about, they believe three to seven years to pay off that debt. They were one of the first free black families to settle in the area during the 18th century. The 1737 list of taxables for the upper Patapso hundred listed only two free blacks, the Banneker couple um, as residing in Baltimore County. That's, just, that's pretty significant. And then a little less than 20 years later, the 1755 uh, census, which is the earliest accounting of Maryland's population lists only 212 free black individuals residing in Baltimore County. That was pretty small compared to the 12,886 whites and 4,097 enslaved people living in the county. Banneker inherited the homestead after his parents' death, or I think around 1760. He most likely chain, uh, changed, they were tobacco farmers. He most likely changed to a more diversified crop system as a result of the Ellicott influence in the later, eight, eight, sorry, 18th century. So he corresponded frequently with the Ellicotts. He eventually passed away in 1806 and the Ellicotts took over the land. Unfortunately, a fire consumed the homestead around that same time. So its history was virtually left in the ashes. Luckily, historians have some firsthand recollections from people um, of contemporary with Banneker um, of the homestead itself. An 1836 account by former friend, Susanna Mason, she actually went searching for the homestead and she said his dwelling was a lowly dwelling built of logs, one story in height and surrounded by an orchard. And so she went back in 1836 to find the remains, but mentions the fire had consumed the cottage and wasted every vestige belonging there too. And then in 1854, Martha Ellicott Tyson recalled Banneker's dwelling it was, was about half a mile from the Patapsco River where a never failing spring issued from beneath a large golden willow tree in the midst of his orchard. So these, these descriptions entice local resident, which many of you know, most of you know, Charles Wagon in 1979, along with other residents and archeologists to search for the remains of this homestead. Between 1979 and 1982, surveying did not locate the farm. Archeologists placed one eight by eight unit, eight, that's feet, um, and did not uncover any evidence of the Bannikers. They did, they did find other um, later um, remnants of the Lee farmstead and the Truth farm. In 1982, Mr. Wagon identified another two areas of significance. And um, by that point, Baltimore County Rec and Parks purchased additional 42.8 acres. So they asked Maryland Historic Trust to complete a three month long survey of the 72 acres. So phase one archeological investigations in two areas, um, which you can see on the left-hand side were identified. 
Um, the pattern and, and the right-hand side shows um, artifact distribution associated with architectural artifacts, nails, window glass. Um, so you can see the clusters of where the greatest amount of architectural artifacts were found. The patterning suggesting the location of a home dwelling or outbuildings. Uh, a year later, after several rounds of shovel testing, archaeologists were able to pinpoint the 18th to early 19th century occupation to four specific areas. Areas they labeled 1A through 1D. Maryland Historical Trust plan on identifying the remains, but not excavating to completion. They just sampled a specific amount, just enough to obtain data to use in the development and interpretation of the Benj Benjamin Banneker Historical Park. So a lot of the site remains unexcavated for future research. At this point, they did conduct a remote sensing ground penetrating radar and gradiometer survey, but the area was too disturbed with modern trash and just a lot of disturbance and noise. So the re results from that were inconclusive. Excavating 41 test units within areas 1A through 1D, archeologists were able to identify a tight site boundary as well as two cultural features, feature 10 and 22, which were two cellar features dating from two separate periods of occupation in the 18th century. So this is feature 10, as you can see, it was identified as a cellar hole in the area 1A listed there. And it had a possible hearth feature on the perimeter. You can see where it says burned soil. We believe that that was a hearth area. Other smaller features such as post holes and stone foundation piers also supported a structure in this location. Architectural artifacts recovered included nails, window glass, and daub, which is just a, a burnt fired clay, suggesting a mud and stick chimney, which is quite typical of the earliest frontier cabins at the time. And I have, oh, whoops, this is feature 10. So this is the profile of all the different layers of the feature um, of the cellar hole as they were filled. And the right-hand side was a photograph. I apologize, it's not in color. You don't have any colored pictures of that. But this is what they interpreted. This would be an example of what the earlier structure would have been interpreted as. And they found evidence of the post holes from the, that stick leaning against the chimney. And it was built that way in case if there was a fire, they could push the chimney away from the house. All right, uh, feature 22 was also identified as another cellar hole. And this was located in area 1B, which is just south of 1A. Uh, a concentration of stones of varying sizes were identified in the southern perimeter. You can see those down here, containing remnants of a stone foundation. Artifacts such as creamwares, pearlwares, salt glaze stonewares, suggest a later period, later into the um, 18th century of the Banneker occupation. This area was identified as a second dwelling on the homestead, most likely built after the first fell into disrepair. Many artifacts from test units in this area were burnt, um, had artifacts that were burnt, providing further evidence of the residents that burned down in 1806. Additional probing measured a continuous stone foundation measuring roughly 14 feet by 16 feet with an exterior masonry chimney common in the area towards the early 19th century. So um, here's a photo of the feature. And these little flips here are just um, bulkheads that are left. Um, so these would have been different units. And then this is an example of what the later structure may have looked like. It's a more permanent chimney. So areas 1C and 1D, flip back here, were not excavated, fully excavated, but features that were identified were of either fence line, post molds, or natural features. Um, a total of 28,000 artifacts were recovered from the site mostly dating to the Banneker 18th century occupation. An extensive artifact analysis was given um, and um, Robert Hurry actually published the report. You can find a copy of it in, the, in your local library in Howard County. 
Um, this analysis showed not only how the Bannockers lived as free black family in, in a plantation society, but also how Benjamin Bannocker's lifestyle changed during his life um, through, from childhood through adulthood. So an example of this is uh, archeologists conducted an artifact analysis. Um, they conducted a minimum vessel count. So they looked at the minimum numbers of ceramic vessels that were recovered from one site. So for the Bannocker site, they identified 277 individual pottery vessels ranging from utilitarian storage vessels to dining, fine dining and drinking ware. They looked at the distribution of vessels between the two home sites and it's Benjamin seemed to acquire more vessels when, um, than his family had in the earlier 18th century. This pattern is typical of the time due to changing economic status and conspicuous consumption. Ceramic wares consisted of cream wares, pearl wares, white and Rhenish stone wares, and dipped earthenware. So these are just some examples of some of the, um, the photographs of the pottery. Um, another type of analysis they, that they did was faunal analysis. Archaeologists also tried to identify all the species of faunal remains recovered from their sites to determine what kind of diet the residents practiced, as well as how those diets evolved over time. Domestic animals such as cow, pig, sheep and chicken were all recovered, as well as wild species such as fish, turtle, and oyster. And clam. Prior to 1760, the family was dependent on not only the animals they raised on their farm, but also wild species. After 1760, Benjamin was able to purchase more food from the local store, Ellicott and Company, rather than relying completely on subsistence hunting. So this is a very typical pattern that you see at um, colonial 18th century through early 19th century sites. So these are just some images of other um, cool artif whoops, other artifacts that they found. Um, the image on the top left is actually an optical lens from what they believe was a telescope. And you know Benjamin was an astronomer, so that explains why they found that there. And um, tobacco pipe fragments, a jaw harp. The image, the um, drawing in the bottom left is a um, shaving razor blade, slate pencils, and a lot of, um, they found a lot of buttons and shoe buckles. So the Benjamin Banneker Homestead site is significant to the Patapsco Valley Heritage Area because it is one of the rare sites that interprets the personal lives of free blacks in the 18th century frontier. When this region was just a wild, yeah, like I said, like a wild frontier. It also tells the story of Benjamin Banneker through the material culture from childhood through him being America's first African-American and man in science. So the third site is near and dear to my heart, um, the Patapsco Female Institute. And this site is protected through um, preservation easements. So I'm going to henceforth refer to the site as PFI for short. Um, it once stood as a beacon for female education in Maryland throughout the 19th century. Settled in Ellicott's Mills, PFI was in operation from 1837 to 1890 with corporation fully dissolved in 1891. By 1965, the Temple on the Hill had fallen into complete ruins and the newly formed Howard County Department of Rec and Parks purchased the property in the hopes of future preservation and stabilization. Over the past 30 plus years, archeological investigations have been conducted by avocational and professional archeologists to locate and identify subsurface features associated with the school and its landscape. And there were many other uses of this, this property besides a school, but right now I'm just focusing on it as a school. So the first round of archeology span was conducted during the pre-construction years, 1987 to 1989, to identify any possible subsurface features that could be disturbed during work. A total of 242 shovel tests were excavated. Where a possible feature was identified, these pits were expanded to a one by one meter square and excavated. Several potential features were identified, but they were not thoroughly documented. Um, they were under a great time constraint, which was a huge challenge for them. For the possible features closer to the main structure, later phase two investigations would further document those. 
Unfortunately, little documentation exists to properly interpret this phase of investigation. Um, the artifacts were never cataloged. So my archivist now is in the process of cataloging artifacts so we can actually analyze. Um, they were able to delineate those specific areas to try to avoid during construction and uh, stabilization over the next few years. So phase two um, occurred during 1993 and they were conducted by um, Dr. Gibb, uh, James Gibb and Tara Pe Pettit. These investigations were required prior to the stabilization of the ruins. A total of 55 um, units were placed around the perimeter of the building, as you can see in the, in the image above. Um, Dr. Gibb, in um, his summary of this site, because no formal um, report had been done until I had to actually write the report this past year, but he did summarize that the artifact patterning around the complex has been very difficult to identify and interpret due to the large quantity of demolition debris from the 1960s and trash left by vandals. And the art artifact catalog is very much looking like that. And um, further work that I've been doing very much looks like that as well. So during these investigations, a total of 29,360 artifacts um, were recovered, ranging from school era to modern beer bottles. The excavations provide precise locational information and some architectural details on three framed additions, which I'll sh um, show you in a map. Um, a schoolroom edition, a dining hall edition from the 1880, and a hotel edition. Um, once it ended as a school, it, they turned it into a hotel. They were all demolished by 1919. Artifacts are currently in the process of being cataloged, um, but from what we know so far, patterning around the complex has been very difficult to identify and interpret. Um, I Judging on um, some work that I've been doing recently, which I'll talk about in a minute, I don't know if they actually excavated deep enough um, to find um, anything related to the school era. They did find this feature in the lower left-hand corner. It's a corner of one of the, um, the school era additions that they interpreted as. So archeology, span um, was conducted after stabilization um, as part of a public archaeology grant that um, Mr. Um, Lee Preston obtained from the Maryland Humanities. Unfortunately, no field notes or records exist from this time period. He, he did a lot of um, summer camps and he worked with his high school students. Um, the work consisted of the excavation of a 12 by 12 meter area to the north of the ruins, believed to be a kitchen midden. So, and the maps on the left-hand side are the 1887 and 1894 Sanborn fire insurance maps that we have of the site. And you can see the additions in the back of the building. And I have circled here the area where they found this midden. The kitchen midden contained a number of artifacts, including slate pencils, buttons, bone toothbrushes, porcelain doll parts, a bone dye, ceramics, bottle glass, bone and other various domestic trash. Um, and make, it's a mixed context of time periods. So one of the units contained remnants of a stone foundation, most likely associated with either the stable or the engineering building as depicted on the 1887 Sanborn map. But this feature was unfortunately removed and put back in place and not properly documented. So further work needs to be done in that area. So recent excavations, whoops. Um, in 2019, I had to monitor um, for an ash tree removal on the property. And it uncovered the remains of a possible structure to the Northwest of the ruins. And um, so you can see here a linear, and then it also goes that way. We do know that there were buildings in the back of the building. We have this 1837 lithograph illustration by E. Sachs and it depicts, you can see the two, uh, two structures behind the building. And we're not quite sure as of yet what those buildings are for. We do have, we do have sources that talk about other um, buildings in the property, like Elmira Hart Lincoln Phelps, her, she lived there on the, like a cottage. Um, Robert Archer, who was later principal, had a cottage. There was a gardener's cottage. So 
we can only find this information through archaeology. So now I'm currently in the process of, um, as part of the 250th anniversary of Ellicott City, the Ellicott City Garden Club is planning on recreating a historical garden based on the findings of, um, Riley Goodman found a book of pressed flowers that was created by a student. And um, there were plants that were found on the property when it was a school. So the Garden Club has planned to put in this beautiful garden, interpretive garden. And so, what had happened was they were going to put it in, an, in a, what we thought was a disturbed area. And when I was monitoring, when um, one of my colleagues was, was tilling, we hit a possible foundation. So we had to move it. We had to find another location. We had to go through Maryland Historical Trust. And we've come across two areas um, on the left, on the upper right hand, two pictures, a terracotta drainage pipe, and then an iron drainage pipe. So we know that, I mean, we have lots of issues at PFI now with water and, and flooding. Um, so I think they had the same, they had the same issues when it was a school. So they probably had this drainage system draining water down the hill. Um, these units are very deep. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't know if they actually excavated as far as they should have um, because there's this entire level of fill. You can see all these rocks. Um, of me in this in this never ending um, excavation unit. So that was all fill um, added when they dug this trench out for the pipe, they just filled everything back filled with rocks. Um, it's quite backbreaking. But we're actually still out there. And if anybody's interested in volunteering, um, we're going to be out there this spring. So yeah, so this area is still being analyzed, so I don't have any definitive answer about what's going on yet. Based on the past 35 years of investigations at PFI and the lack of recordation and proper documentation, further work is recommended in order to properly document and interpret the history of the site as a school for female education. So very little of the archaeology that's been done has, has given us any answers about the property when it was a school. While there is presently a preservation easement on the property, we hope to be able to conduct more work um, as public education to, feed, uh, to obtain better data about the earlier school and hotel periods. The Patapsco Female Institute is a significant site throughout the Patapsco Valley Heritage Area because it offers a view on the lives of women's history, something often neglected in historical interpretation. Education for women, even, oops, education, um, as, progress as progressive as the curriculum at PFI was very rare in the 19th century. While we're lucky to have a lot of documentation about the school era and its students, um, this is not often the case. So only through the lens of archeology span can we better get a better understanding of the lives of these women. So why is archeology span so important? This is a, a very frightening picture to archeologists. Span From our three sites, we have seen that without archeology, span we are dealing with the histories of people who did not leave behind very accurate or specific written records. So material culture is what we need to rely on to interpret their past. Without this rich archeological record, we would not know about Native American settlement patterns in the Patapsco River Valley or the personal lives of one of the few free black families to live in the area in the 18th century or the experiences of young females obtaining a very rare education. Unfortunately, archaeology has not been taken as seriously as it could be in the, in the heritage area or Howard County for that matter. So what can be done about that? Over the past 20 years, several jurisdictions, as I mentioned earlier, including Prince George's County, Anne Arundel County, and the city of Frederick, have fought for laws and ordinances to be passed to protect and preserve our archaeological heritage. All of these initiatives began with grassroots community preservation efforts. These codes and ordinances requires the evaluation of all development projects for which sites plan must be filed to determine the potential for impacting archeological resources and whether there is a need for preservation action prior to site development. My dream is to one day have something similar established, not just in the heritage area, but in Howard County and other counties throughout the state of Maryland. With every development, we lose significant information to our past. 
This, however, can only start with grassroots initiatives from members of the community and private organizations who sincerely care about the preservation of our past. So what can you do? Um, you can become a volunteer of um, our my new public archaeology program, Ark in the Parks. Uh, become a member of the Archaeological Society of Maryland. Participate in volunteer-based archaeological projects. If you see, say something, say if you see something, say something. And the most important is contact your local council members and politicians to voice your support. Thank you very much. And there's my email address if anybody wants to contact me about volunteering or any concerns you have. Kay Palick at Howard County md.gov. So I'm going to stop share now so I can answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can either enter them in the chat or Q&A boxes now. Uh, additionally, you can click the raise hand uh, button on your toolbar at the bottom of your screen and I can uh, enable your microphone so you can ask your question. <laughs> well, Kelly, I know I'm curious about, uh, well, you're, I know you've got your hands full with everything going on at PFI, <laughs> but are there any additional sites um, in particular that you have a interest in breaking dirt and exploring? <laughs> yeah, so in the heritage area, and ironically, little work has been done on the mills, um, the archaeological study of mills. Um, which is what Ellicott City was founded on. And I know um, my colleague, Adam Frakia has brought up the idea of um, excavating and looking at investigating Ilchester, the Ilchester area. So um, I know he's talked with Kyla about that. So that's one area of interest. Um, and like within Ellicott City itself, it would be interesting to, because there's just a lot of, interesting history that's not known about Ellicott City. The fact that there were, you know, many clusters of free black communities in Ellicott City. It would be wonderful to be able to um, investigate in Ellicott City. Robert. Yeah. And I know yeah. there's, there's plenty of, there's lots of sites in the um, state park, but they're very particular about having work done. So, cause they're worried about looting and, and all that, so. Yeah, yeah. I had to give a presentation on the archaeology of the Patapsco Valley State Park, and I had to talk more about the potential of archaeology in the state park because there's been very little done. Yeah. Okay, so we have um, a question from Bob Buker uh, saying he understands there is a Civil War fort in Howard County, Elkridge. Has there been any archaeology there? Um, unfortunately not. Um, I know it's in Annapolis Junction. I know exactly where it was. And um, I, I don't know who owns the property right now. It's along the railroad tracks. But yeah, it was a well-known um, area in Relay. So, and there's also um, <laughs> another, another site that I was researching in the heritage area, um, Camp Johnson, which was a, a union um, encampment of the 12th New Jersey, and they actually encamped in Ellicott's Mills. Um, um, just, um, yeah, so there's a lot, there's a lot of Civil War um, sites within, it's just a matter of getting on, uh, you know, private property and having time to investigate. And, yeah, it's, it's such a time consuming process. It is. <laughs> a lot of paperwork, a lot of red tape. Yeah. Um, so we have a, another question from Peter Conrad and then we will get to uh, Dave Taylor. Uh, Peter yep. would like to know, do you know if the Wilkins Rogers mill will be looked at for archeology span remains as it's redeveloped? Um, that is a very good question. Um, you know, cause it was built in the area near where the original Patapsco flour mills were. Um, there's probably, there's not a requirement for it. Um, who owns that property now? 
who's who I should say who is going to own that property does anybody know because it's really up to the, the landowner and if we could talk to the landowner then it probably David too far out um it, it could serve if as long as you know we could get property um owner's permission then certainly um something could probably be done there that's a that's a very good uh, suggestion Pete. yeah okay uh let's see here Dave. Hi, Dave. <laughs> hi kelly hi can you can you hear me i'm using my ipad for the first time i can hear you okay you mentioned Ellicott City. I was wondering if there's any chance that uh, someone will have a chance to see what's underground when they start drilling the drainage tunnels up there under the demolished buildings. Yeah, they have um, under section 106, it's law that there's actually a committee. So they will have people out from the trust um, to monitor when that takes place. I know that um, they've done some boreholing up there on Maryland Avenue. And I think that they found like a piece of wood, um, but they didn't hit any structures or anything. But um, yeah, so somebody will be out there from the trust to monitor that. Oh, that's if, good, if thanks. They, and unfortunately, if they do find something, they have to stop and document it. So they actually found um, during the, you know, right after the flood, they had found um, like a, a stone wall in upper, upper Maine and they had to actually go out and document that. So that could that could put another damper in the in the project. Yeah, good and bad news. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, any further questions? And if anybody um, wants to volunteer, um, you can just reach out to me. And I have a I have a um, email list that I send out um, weekly updates about what's going on, whether it be in the lab or out in the field. Our field um, session, our field opportunities are starting to pick up now that the weather's getting warmer. So this summer we're going to be the spring and summer we're going to be finishing up at um, Patapsco Female Institute, and we're going to be um, continuing our work on a, an African-American site, a tenant site out in Western, um, like West Friendship area, crossing the fairgrounds. And we're also, next week, I'm starting to document um, a segregated cemetery. It's St. Mary Cemetery in the middle of Turf Valley. It was associated with St. Charles College and um, St. Mary's um, at the, the little church that was added on at Doe Reagan. So we have able to um, do some historic research and they, a lot of the workers from the St. Charles College um, were buried there and they actually had a segregated area for the black employees. So we're gonna be mapping and documenting that um, as well. Um, oh. uh, so we do have another quick question from Linda Richardson asking um, when the demo will begin on the buildings. I'm assuming uh, the one domain. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. I know. Um, talking with my boss, I think something came up. Oh, they're waiting on permission from CSX to to go underneath the railroad. So they don't have permissions yet. So they have to wait for that. Okay. I see um, a couple. Thanks for that. Okay, yeah. Um, oh, we have another question from Ethan um, asking about historic dams along the Patapsco. Yeah, there's a lot um, that, <laughs> there are a lot out there that have not been documented. Um, and then I can send you, Ethan, some info. Um, and at the the blo Bloody Dam, is that how you mm -hmm. pronounce it? Was it's no, no longer there. Um, but other dams associated with mills are certainly out there, um, and along the Patuxent as well. There's plenty that haven't been documented yet. Awesome. And then Lisa Lisa had mentioned something about. Um, 
Henry's. Henry Sharp's talk on the 30th. Yes, yes. I'll be um, putting up a uh, flyer with the the date um, and uh, information shortly. Um, but okay, I think that was indeed all of the questions. Um, I am just pulling up an image real quickly. Um, Sorry, one moment. There and I'm very go. proud of myself for keeping it under the time limit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, this has been um, a great presentation. Thank, thank you, you so much. Um, uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us for Kelly's talk today. I am just going to um, share my screen real quickly. Um, so coming up next Wednesday, we do have our final virtual talk uh, for our 2022 Patapsco Day celebration occurring. Um, it will be our inaugural Charles L. Wagant II Memorial Lecture. Um, author and professor, Dr. Henry K. Sharp will be uh, giving a talk uh, titled Pioneering Innovations in the Patapsco Valley, um, where he'll explore strategies and technologies embraced by the Valley's early entrepreneurs. So please consider joining us. Um, we really hope you do. It should be a, a wonderful talk. Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. It's now seven, so we'll say goodbye. Um, Thank you again, Kelly. This has been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs>